Kate is here to tell us a story that she has also pitched multiple times. And we really liked this story, both because it's just an interesting story, but also because it celebrates the value of obscure knowledge and also the value of very significant, important errors and proofreading. So <laughs> I would like to welcome Kate to the stage to talk about seaweeds versus Nazis and how a typo helped win World War II. Preemptively pinned. All right. Okay, let's see if it's up a little more. Hello, everyone. <laughs> I'm doing it wrong. Give me back this one. Oh, back. no. Okay. I'm tall. There we go. There we go. This is just making it more climactic. <laughs> I promise. How's this? Yes? All right. Okay, so I am not gonna trip over that cord. I am so excited to get to tell you the story, finally. Um, it is one of my favorites. There we go, okay. <laughs> All right, now we are actually ready. So tonight I tell you a tale of war, secrets, cunning brilliance, and one man at the center of it all by mistake. Before we meet our hero, let us set the scene. It is September 1939. Hitler has just invaded Poland. Britain has just declared war. World War II has just begun. Now, all German military messages are being encoded with the purportedly unbreakable Enigma machine. And, you know, September 1939, if the Allies are able to break the code for this, know where uh, German and Axis forces are going to be and when and where the targets are, this can defect, affect the outcome of the war and the length as well. Spoiler alert, it did. I always ruin the endings. Uh, the code breaking or the work that we're gonna about to talk about is um, shorten the war by about two to four years, enable D-Day, et cetera, greatly affected the outcome. So important stuff. Now, Quick pause, I think it's critical to this talk to understand why the Enigma was considered unbreakable. Um, it's fascinating, and as my high school teacher told me, show don't tell in English class, we do not have time to show. So I'm going to do a very cursory explanation of this, and if you would like to learn more about how the Enigma machine worked, you can come talk to me after, or even better, look around the audience uh, as I give this cursory explanation, and whoever is like, tut-tutting the most, talk to them. <laughs> All right, no, seriously. Uh, <laughs> come to the crypto corner. It's somewhere over there. Good luck. So, basic, basic, basic. You type in your message. On the light board, the encoded version comes up. Someone else has an Enigma machine at the other receiving end that has the same configuration as yours. They type in the coded message and the decoded message lights up. So easy. <laughs> um, one of the reasons though why it was so not easy <laughs> in terms of breaking is basically because it was encoded in multiple places. So when you hit that key, it goes to the plug board and the static wheel and then it is encoded again in three different rotor wheels, reflector back through the rotor wheels, back to the plug board and then it lights up. And when you hit the key a second time, one of the rotors turns, at least one. So basically you could hit a V again, but this time it would be encoded as a different letter. In other words, you could have a whole page of L's and you put it into the Enigma and it's a whole page of gibberish and you put it back through the Enigma with the same configuration, and it's a whole page of L's. Um, basically, there are 150 million, million, million different ways that the Enigma can encode any message. If you crack it, that's awesome, but you're gonna have to start again tomorrow because the rotor configurations and plug board configurations are changed every goddamn day. So, <laughs> September 1939, um, a few months ago, Polish cryptographers met with Britain and let them know that they actually had cracked Enigma in the past and had built machines to help them do so. And um, 
they built the machines. Alan Turing then greatly improved, you know, improved upon them, started in Poland. But uh, Poland is now invaded, and so um, for national security reasons, the cryptographers have had to flee, which basically means that should the unbreakable be broken, it is up to France and Britain. Enter Bletchley Park. This is the best story you've never heard about Bletchley Park, I promise. <laughs> All right, so September 1939, a year ago, uh, the government co-breaking office said, hey, we need to find a place that is out of the way and won't be a target. How about this gaudy mansion in the English countryside? <laughs> Perfect. Um, there are some really amazing quotes from architects talking about how this is a horror of all horrors, but <laughs> we'll leave that aside for the moment. So in September 1939, uh, it is this small, you know, clever chaps, breaking code, secret, top secret, and a gaudy and coast mansion, as you do. Um, they're going to need a lot more people. The day that Blurton declares war, September 3rd, 1939, the head of Bletchley writes and uh, writes to the for Foreign Office and says, they really need more people. Um, they need men of the professor type. <laughs> yes. Uh, now, by the peak of the code-breaking operation, Bletchley Park actually had 10,000 employees, three-quarters of which were women. Yes. But the first code-breakers that they were recruiting, they needed a little bit more, um, they wanted them to have some more established male qualifications in order to come. And uh, they were basically looking for anyone who is, you know, already working in this field. Uh, mathematicians, maybe some chess champions, people whose thinking skills will adapt to code breaking very easily without a lot of training, even better if you study cryptograms. So as they gather in these very first recruits, one of the first recruits is from this bunch here of the brightest minds. I mean, they are looking for the brightest people in the country. It is critical if they're going to survive. So one of the first recruits is our hero, Jeffrey Tandy. Uh, it's a natural recruit. He is an Oxford man. He's a World War I vet. Uh, he is an expert in cryptogams and is actually the head of cryptogam research at the Natural History Museum. It's great. So he gets a mysterious message in the mail summoning him to report to Station X. He goes to Bletchley Park. He signs the Official Secrets Act, keep it secret, keep it safe. And he sits down and is told what Bletchley Park is about. And like, I would give anything <laughs> to be in that room at that moment for what I imagine is one of the most awkward conversations in history. See, they were looking for experts in cryptograms, but Jeffrey Tandy was an expert in cryptogams. Do any of you know the difference? Now, okay, the British Foreign Office did not. <laughs> There's, you know, a slight difference. Uh, cryptograms are text that's in code, and cryptogams, just, you know, slightly different. They are plants that reproduce with spores, such as algae, <laughs> lichen, and seaweed. Basically, they were looking for Elizabeth Salanders and they came and hired the Lupin Lady. <laughs> <laughs> Jeffrey Tandy studied seaweed. Uh, <laughs> expert in seaweed. Uh, and now, you know, I mean, he had some other pursuits. It's not like the only thing he did was study green slime. He, um, this is actually him pictured in a bed sheet. It is the only easily accessible photo of this man, which <laughs> I love. as you do. <laughs> so some of his other hobbies included cheating on his wife, um, doing BBC radio dramas, which was cool, and drinking with his BFF T.S. Eliot, who was godfather to one of his daughters. He actually was the first person to uh, broadcast Practical Cats on BBC radio. Pretty cool. None of these things are very helpful in a code-breaking <laughs> career. So 
basically, like to say the least, oh, here's his little uh, thing with T.S. Eliot, it, uh, like being among the first people recruited to Bletchley is the most amazing, <laughs> embarrassing mistake. <laughs> so nowadays, most companies have a probation clause for new hires, so when you could be hired in, your HR department would say, oops, I'm so sorry, we got the totally wrong profession, go along on your merry way. Bletchley was a little different. Uh, Bletchley was not top secret work, it was ultra top secret work, which is a level above top secret that I did not know existed. Because, you know, if anyone found out that they were going to be, like how much code breaking they were actually doing, the Germans could completely change how they were sending signals and it would mess up everything. So people weren't allowed to tell their families, they weren't allowed to tell anyone. Uh, the public didn't even find out about it until the 1970s that it even existed. So once you're in, it's kind of a Hotel California situation, like <laughs> you check in, you do not check out. Like they are, you're there. So being the solid British chap that he was, uh, Tandy set to learn about code breaking. Like, literally anything about code breaking. <laughs> anything. Anything. Okay, who was this guy? Um, we don't know actually that much about Jeffrey Tandy. I kind of get the sense that a lot of the people closest to him didn't really either. He was a very secretive man. Um, the only thing that's really written about him is a college thesis biography by his son, which like the first two pages of which are all about Douglas Adams' life, you know, the meaning of life, the universe and everything, it is, um, it's a tome. And, <laughs> but basically, okay, so he was born into a working class family, he wanted to be a priest, he um, ended up going to Oxford on the British version of his GI Bill, and became a scientist, met his wife um, at Bletchley Park, he started a second secret family that was maybe not so secret, <laughs> as you do, and, um, and he dabbled in BBC radio broadcasting, as I said, was an expert in seaweed in the Sargasso Sea and the Great Barrier Reef. Uh, his son describes him sort of as an older man, and I get the idea that he was just like a really amazing crotchety old man uh, because he, you know, like a good biologist labeled everything in his house. And his son describes how he liked the finer things in life, even if they couldn't afford them. And so that, quote, even if the house did leak, when we drove out, we did so in style. And uh, he also describes it as driving, quote, in a stately fashion with sweeping contempt for everyone else on the road, most of whom were dismissed as damn fools. <laughs> he was a big drinker, referred to pints as quartz. Uh, you know, he was a guy. <laughs> um, eventually, he was at Bletchley, nicknamed Six, after the, na the number of the naval section in which he was in charge pause, we're going to go back to that embarrassing moment in 1939. Okay, so Tandy's giving code breaking his best college try. Um, for one reason or another, I'm not quite sure, I like to think because he studied seaweed, <laughs> they put him in the naval section. <laughs> <laughs> to be clear, I have no evidence that that is true. However, <laughs> I like to think that. Um, basically, uh, the na what was going on in the naval section was really, really critically important. Um, headed up by Alan Turing, it, trying to break the naval enigma was an entirely different situation than uh, the enigma codes being used in the Air Force and the Army. Basically, there were a lot of human errors that were used in the other divisions. For example, maybe don't start all your messages with the same words of Heil Hitler. Um, <laughs> for multiple reasons. Uh, so... <laughs> So Germany's Navy was a lot stricter uh, in how they actually correctly operated the Enigma, but not only that, they had a whole extra system of encryption, seven extras to be exact, uh, called the Bigram Tables. So basically, Bigrams. Okay, so imagine that you have this totally randomly chosen phrase, and uh, if usually you put it into the Enigma, gibberish, put a take it out of the enigma phrase. With the Navy, you put it first into these code books, these bedroom tables, so that 
what you put into the Enigma is already in code. So for code breakers, them trying to figure out what the correct answer is out of the Enigma is basically impossible because they're just trying to figure out whatever is already in code. There's no thing to help them make sense of it. And so it is basically physically impossible to break unless you have these code books. Now, German naval code was not only the hardest to crack, it was also one of the most important and really key in determining the Battle of the Atlantic. So British, Britain is an island at war and they depend upon all of these convoys of goods from America to be able to fight and survive. Um, I believe it was a million tons per week of uh, goods that they needed, all of their food, fuel, etc. The German U-boats, knowing this, um, employed what they, boats. <laughs> Boots. <laughs> right, I'm just gonna keep talking to take this joke. Uh, basically what would happen is they have what they called a wolf pack strategy. So U-boats would uh, swim around, I know swim isn't the right word, uh, under the water with their little periscope. Uh, <laughs> Whenever anyone would see one of these major convoys, they would radio the other U-boats. The other U-boats would come and uh, underwater basically surround the convoy. And then at night, they would raise up to the water and attack. So basically, Allied ships were being destroyed more quickly by far than they could be built. And um, like you can't overstate how important it was that food and fuel get to England. And basically, there's going to be no way that they could prevent this unless they could crack the naval, the naval code. And there's no way that they could crack the naval code unless they had those goddamn code books. Germany knew this. And so they, were, they took extra precautions. The code books were written in water-soluble ink. So if you could capture, toss them overboard, all good. Basically, as, nothing, as long as nothing is recovered or shared, we're all good. The system is foolproof. May 9th, 1941, a cataclysmic event occurs, and it, it deserves its own talk, and we don't have time for it, but the German U-boat U-110 was captured, and the code books and the Enigma machine on board were recovered by the British. <laughs> Huzzah. Uh, these books, along with a couple other ones that had been recovered, were like the holy grail, right? And would make a huge difference in the ability to continue fighting. There's just one thing. By the time these books, all recovered at sea, all in submarines and ships, and uh, all of these, right, all the way to Bletchley Park, a lot of them had gotten water damaged. They were waterlogged, and basically would be completely unintelligible if you tried to open the pages and were pretty useless. And I just like, can't imagine to be so close and yet so far. And, and then, and goddamn then. Okay, he may not have belonged where he was, he may have been brought in mistakenly, he may have been crap at learning code breaking, but goddamn it, if career seaweed specialist Jeffrey Tandy didn't know how to perfectly separate and preserve thin, fragile pieces of wet shit. Jeffrey Tandy, as unlikely of a hero as you can get, wrote back to the Natural History Museum, sent back for his drying paper supplies. The books were preserved. The name of Enigma was, for a time, cracked. And it was a goddamn game changer. Um, as for our man Tandy, he was promoted to Naval Lieutenant Commander after that and uh, considered himself a Navy man basically for the rest of his life. <laughs> he never went back to being a seaweed scientist. Uh, <laughs> and he actually, after Bletchley Park dissolved, stayed on with the government code breaking office for about another decade. Um, Sort of his later years, he dabbled about, I think it must have been very difficult for anyone who was part of that operation at that time to assimilate back into regular life. Basically, uh, sort of in his final years, he ended up renting a, an apartment that was on the state funeral route for Winston Churchill, and when asked why, I said, because I was his man. And I think that's how he thought of himself um, for the rest of his life. So 
what you've just seen is, I think, the most comprehensive tale about Jeffrey Tandy that has been presented to the public. There is a short thing written by the Natural History Museum on him, and all the rest of this, I've spent the last couple years on and off piecing the pieces together. So he's not really known for this like amazing story. Um, he's known, if anything, for being the Lieutenant Commander of Naval Section 6. But luckily, <laughs> he does have a few lines of a verse in a song that people used to sing at Bletchley Park, which obviously I am going to sing to you now. For a man who shines in 70 lines, an alias is handy. Just give him a ring in the naval wing as Lieutenant Commander Tandy. Thank you. This is one of my favorite stories ever. Uh, just because like, at one time or another, I'm sure we have all been in situations where we feel completely intimidated and unprepared and a fish out of water. And in most of those, there is some little gem that we would never expect would be remotely applicable. But because especially us, our dabblers, you know, in this sort of obscure knowledge, uh, it ends up being so. And I just, this is my favorite example of that ever. So. I would like to make a toast to all you beautiful weirdos for the new year. When you find yourself in your proverbial greatest national crisis ever, may you too tap the unexpected strength of your fascination with proverbial green slime. Cheers. So we, we preemptively pinned Kate without asking her permission. <laughs> so it might be awkward, <laughs> but I guess, yes, I, I do have to ask. I have to ask if you want to be part of this thing that we are doing here. Would you like to be a fellow Kate? So, usually I like consent, but... <laughs> All right, we're wrapping up for this evening and for this year. And uh, for those of you who have been asking and wondering, I would like to uh, point to the work that John Adams have been do doing for the last most of this year. You can find his absolutely uh, tireless uh, expertise giving to this project has been incredible and he has been quietly uploading videos for most of this year um, to our YouTube channel. You should check it out. There, it has now has an archive uh, divided by talks um, and it has, like I said, almost all of this year's talks. So please subscribe and check them out. Take a look at past talks. We'll be adding more things there um, as we are able to. And I want to take a moment to thank all of you again and I'd like to thank Public Works for giving us a new home for this year. You guys have been amazing. And we're really looking forward to a new year starting, starting right back here again. And I want to thank my partners, uh, Trey and Tamara and Isolde, for all of the hard work that they do for this project. And once again, to the fellows, to the speakers, to all of you potential speakers in the audience, one more raised glass, and I'm looking forward to year five starting in February 2018. I sincerely hope to see all of you there. Um, in the meantime, we'll be keeping the conversations going on Facebook in our conversation group, Something Weird. You're all welcome to join. The speakers often post things there that are follow-ups and resources related to our talks. In the meantime, the bar is open. You're welcome to grab another drink, chat with our fellows, ask questions, and please visit the, uh, the uh, holiday shop over at the merch table. I really do not want to have to find a place in my house for all of those sweatshirts, so please take them home with you. And we will see you in the new year. Thank you so much.